everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to this uh, One Dublin, One Book event. My name is Deirdre Madden. I teach creative writing here in Trinity College. Uh, Trinity School of English uh, is hosting the event today um, and uh, together with the Trinity Long Room Hub Arts and Humanities Research Institute here in college, we're very grateful to them. They're looking after the technical, technical side of things. Uh, the event is, of course, connected to the coroner's daughter this year's One Dublin, One Book by Andrew Hughes. I'm delighted to welcome Andrew along. And the title of the event is Writing the Past. It's about writing historical fiction. As you know, there have been lots of really marvelous events uh, around this book and uh, looking at various topics. But today is very much focused on writing, on writing historical fiction. Um, Andrew, you're very welcome. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. And um, because uh, it's always a good idea not to talk in a void, I'm pretty sure everybody who's attending this has probably read the book in advance, but it's always lovely to have a taste of the actual text. So I'd ask you, Andrew, just to get us into the world of uh, Abigail Lawless um, and takes back to the 19th century. Just read us a very short passage from the novel. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, this passage comes about midway through the novel. It's when Abigail is visiting her friend uh, in Fitzwilliam Square. I've chosen this particular paragraph because Fitzwilliam Square has played a huge role in my writing career. My first book was a social history of Fitzwilliam Square. And uh, it's part of the reason that I went into historical fiction. So this is just a, a brief flavor of the book. The genteel terraces of Fitzwilliam Square were broken up by houses still under construction. Men shimmied up ladders and disappeared behind hanging canvas, pod bearers and bricklayers and stucco doors with their overalls daubed and starched by plaster. The south side was entirely unbuilt, giving the current residents a fine view towards the Dublin mountains. In the haze, the hills seemed tantalizingly near, a patchwork of mauve and green, their peaks indistinct against a veil of cloud that spread towards the city. Though a stiff breeze caused the trees to rustle against the spike railings, the sky was static, with spots of brightness here and there, making the true position of the sun unclear. Brilliant, thanks so much. Um, we'll come back to Fitzwilliam Square and your work in writing about that as we were going to talk a little bit about your career, first of all, in the different stages, stages of it. As I said, it's very, very nice to welcome you back to Trinity, even if it's virtually rather than, than, yeah. than in person to the actual to the actual place. Um, because you're an alumni of Trinity, aren't you? You studied here. That's right. Uh, I did a BA in history and English. Uh, graduated, I think, in 2000. It's all a bit of a haze now. <laughs> I concentrated in, uh, on history in my final year. And after that, I remember when I finished, um, you know, the final exams and I was done with my course and all the rest, I was wandering through the corridors of the arts block and saw a notice on the notice board asking for applications for a job for the National Archives Millennium Project, which is rather giving away my age. Um, <laughs> Uh, so they were looking for Eniclan, a company, historical research company, I believe are still going, were looking for graduates to help with this National Archives uh, Millennium Project, which was putting together a CD-ROM of all the different classes of records in the National Archives, scanning them, transcribing them, and then creating this product. So I had no intention or, you know, of, of going into archives. I didn't know what I was going to do after my uh, degree. So I said, I'll go along, I'll apply for this little job. And so straight off the bat, um, my first job coming out of Trinity was straight into the National Archives for this uh, project. And it was a lovely project. It was short term, it was only, I think, over the summer. But just to meet various other people uh, coming from history backgrounds, uh, working on this project, immediately archives became you know, a, a viable career. Uh, so uh, after that, I went straight into the archives course in UCD and uh, did the higher diploma in archive studies and uh, yeah, became a professional archivist, really just because of that fluke not noticing of that uh, <laughs> time on the notice board. That's that's often how life life happens, you know, a chance meeting or a chance seeing of something. If you'd gone down yeah. another 
direction that day. You might, yeah, you might yes. indeed, we might indeed no. be talking today because it all sort of links up, doesn't it? Um, you know, the history in the first instance and then the work as an archivist, which is still, you still work very much with that, don't you? Yeah, so I still do freelance archives work um, writing then, writing historical fiction. And then also I provide a service where I research the history of houses, Georgian houses in particular, but also uh, Georgian estates and castles. So that was work I was doing alongside the archives work. I would um, research these house histories, uh, mm -hmm. especially Georgian, house hist uh, Georgian houses in Fitzwilliam Square and Marion Square and so on. And where I do there is so that the, the owners of the building would ask me to find out all the people who lived in the house down the years. So I'd search registry of deeds, street directories, newspaper archives, find any names that I could, mm -hmm. research those names one by one, and try to put a, a nice narrative together for a particular yeah. house. And it just happened that I was asked to do three houses in a row in Fitzwilliam Square, just unrelated, they just happened okay. to. <laughs> And I said, why don't I just look at all 69 houses? Keep going. <laughs> yeah, keep going. It's a nice start. And um, put them all together as a kind of a social history of a Georgian square. Uh, so I did that. It was um, uh, my first book called Lives Less Ordinary. And it was kind of my introduction to publishing. You know, So just this idea that if you sit down and write a book, there are avenues to get it published if you just, you know, pitch it to publishers and so on as kind of experience just to put a proposal together describing what your idea for the book is to write three or four sample chapters send it out and hopefully land a deal which I did with the Lippy Press so it was a great introduction to the publishing world in general it was uh, great just to be able to realize that I, I was able to sit down and write a book from start to finish to plan it out to do all the research that was necessary and I didn't realize it then because back then I had no intention of going into fiction writing. But all this research had just given me this wonderful setting for historical fiction. Um, and these hundreds of lives that I was uncovering through this, the course of this research, very kind of uh, not well-known people at all, just happened to live in these lovely houses and they had brushes with Irish and European history. But they became a great cast of characters that I could just dip into uh, for historical fiction. And so when I decided to go into fiction writing, I had this, I, I felt very comfortable writing in, in this 19th century Dublin world. Yes, and how, how did that come about? Um, was it just something you'd always wanted to do, writing fiction, or was there a sort of logic in the writing about Fitzwilliam Square and writing, you know, first of all, like history and Trinity, then social history, and then maybe pushing it a bit, a bit further. What did you write next? How did you get into the next stage of, to, where you, yeah. to get to where you are now? Again, like, uh, like the notice on the notice board, it was just one of these fluke things that happened. So I finished the, uh, the social history book, Lives Less Ordinary. David Gibbons was the publisher in the Lippy Press uh, who published the book. And so I, was, I just finished it and he said to me, have you any ideas for another book? You know, because, you know, it's always just asking or you know, wondering what's coming next. And so I was at the cross crossroads then, do I want to stick with writing history or will I try my hand at yeah. historical fiction or fiction in general? But I was always going to go down the historical fiction route, I think. So I said that to David, the publisher, and he said, well, it just so happens that my brother, John Gibbons, is running a historical fiction workshop in the Irish Writer Centre, and it starts in two weeks' time. I said, that sounds ideal. <laughs> uh, I'll sign myself up for that. So uh, uh, John Gibbons, uh, these, uh, David and John are American uh, guys. John Gibbons is an author who wrote uh, a couple of books published in the 80s and 90s. So he's running this historical fiction workshop. So I went along, you know, full of trepidation, never had written any fiction before in my life. Uh, but there was a lovely atmosphere of, I think, six or seven people in that workshop. John was running it. And for the first few weeks, I just didn't want to submit anything. I was too shy. Other people were submitting, obviously, and we were commenting back and forth on their uh, submissions. And then John just said at one stage, said, look, Andrew, you're not going to get any benefit, of course, unless you uh, write something. Get the word so I, <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I sat uh, down and wrote the first chapter of what turned out to be the convictions of John Delahunt. Um, so, and that was kind of beginner's look. Often when you, when you start a book, you, you, the first attempts don't end up in finished manuscript, but this was my first 
time writing historical fiction and the chapter just worked and it ended up in the book itself. But it was just great then to get feedback and encouragement from the other members of the workshop and somebody said, yeah, perhaps this is viable as well. Yes, yeah. I mean, you're a great, <laughs> you're a great advertisement for creative writing and creative writing workshops. I'm very honest as well, because I was saying this to some students the other day, I really understand how difficult it can be to go into a workshop, like even if you really want to write, you want to learn, but I think you're vulnerable in a way that you aren't if you're going to say, I don't know, learn French or <laughs> learn, so yeah. learn something else, yeah. um, because it writing is such a profound thing it's such a personal thing um but it can i think often by going to a workshop it can really speed up your writing career you don't have to do workshops to write but i think that the camaraderie because it often can be a very lonely thing as well writing to associate with people who are interested in the same thing um yeah. the support they give you and the knowledge they give you as well as the 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 person who's moderating it i think they can be very good and as i say you know your wonderful career is a great a great encouragement yeah. could be to anybody Absolutely. Watching, I mean, this, watching this today yeah, possibly. Yeah, possibly. I would have uh, carried on if I hadn't gone to the workshop and just tried my hand in general. But chances are, I would have been discouraged. Chances are, I would have been making mistakes that John, the moderator, was able to just point out. It's just stuff that I think all new writers do, uh, where they don't realize just the kind of the nuts and bolts of writing. When it's just yeah. pointed out to you, it's obvious. But sometimes it just has to be pointed out. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. The camaraderie, because when you join a workshop like that, um, everybody tends to be in the same boat. I mean, I mean, there might be people who have a bit more experience, but generally a lot of the time, a lot of the participants, this is their first time as well. So you do, you're kind of, you're bearing your soul a little bit. And I think I was lucky in that the participants were all very down to earth, decent people. And I'm sure that's going to be the case 90% of the time. I've heard of cases where, you know, you can be unlucky with the group that you end up with, but again, I wouldn't say that to deter anyone. You know, most of the time, most mm -hmm. people will be very open to uh, giving feedback, very generous with their feedback. And I think it's something if you are attending a workshop like that to really just be open to taking the feedback on, and don't don't be upset if uh, if, if somebody says they don't like a certain aspect of your mm -hmm. work, writing or your work, as long as they're doing it in an honest way uh, as long as they're not just kind of dismissing it so like i don't like that because i don't like the start mm -hmm. of some ways. Mm -hmm. as long as there's a reason behind it and you can discuss it you can either agree or disagree mm -hmm. yeah i found mm -hmm. that in the workshop setting if two or three people feel the same thing about something that i've written that's not quite working you have to kind of take that on board because it's like <laughs> that, that general readership then also yeah have that. Yes. so yeah it's, it's a wonderful Wonderful introduction for me into writing fiction. And what really helped was coming from this history background. It helped me to unlearn the discipline of history and to be able to just uh, feel the freedom to make things up and not be bound by historical facts. You have to kind of be found bound by authenticity and a certain amount of accuracy, mm -hmm. but you can play a bit fast and loose with um, mm -hmm. the facts of, of a certain story. Yes, that's an important point. Um, the sort of transition from one type of writing to another as well. Um, and again, that's something one sees in workshops. You might have somebody who comes in who's maybe an experienced journalist, but they want to write fiction, or somebody who's a fiction writer but wants to write for children. And yeah. they're very good at what they're doing. And it does give them already a bit of a head start, like they've got some of the craft or knowledge and confidence, but it can be quite difficult to make that shift from one. Yeah. Like you obviously had done a lot of, um, you know, writing as a history student, as an archivist, but to get into that much more free, imaginative thing. And you did it so well, Andrew. I mean, there's so much to really admire in this in this novel. Um, it's very vivid. And uh, another thing I noticed about it very particularly um, is the narrative moves along really well. It's a real, I thought it was a real page turner. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, and that, that there's, there's a certain skill to that. You know, one reads so many novels that are with lots of longers. Would you like to talk a wee bit about that, about that, about how you made the narrative, how you got the pace 
to to be what it was. I think looking back, it might have been another benefit of this workshop setting in that you tend, like we, we, we started with that historical fiction workshop, but we continued on because the group that was there uh, got on so well. After the Writer Center workshop, which I think was 10 weeks, we just decided to keep meeting. So we would meet in the Gresham every week. Well, we began meeting the library bar, moved to the Gresham. So week by week we met up and we're always kind of submitting parts of our work in progress to each other. And I think that helped. It was like writing a book in serialization, like Dickens in the 1920s. Oh, yes. <laughs> I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah, chapter by chapter and building up a story uh -huh. like that. And because I was writing in that way, you always each week wanted to have something about your submission that had some little plot point revealed or a little tension ratcheted up or something to kind of, you know, just grab the attention that week. So perhaps that in a very kind of mechanical sense, that helped to overall keep the kind of readability and um, uh, tension up throughout the whole book. Uh, otherwise, I can't really say, I think it's just one of those things that, you know, you, you might write it and it, it, again, it's something maybe about redrafting when you're looking through uh, is are certain sections flagging, you know, can, can, can pace be upped by moving parts of the story around. So. Yes. It might be a mechanical way of, of writing a section week by week. And then obviously there's also, there's always uh, second and third drafts and editing. Yes, and so because that is very important, isn't it? Whatever sort of writing you're doing, um, like it's often said, like a lot of writing is really rewriting. It's going back over and looking at it again and again. And I absolutely recognize what you're saying. I think in, when you're writing a novel in particular, when you get to a certain stage, it's really helpful to back to the beginning and just sort of keep reading up until where, where you are now. Yes. And if you're getting bored yourself or if there's something that's really clunky in the middle of it, you'll trip yes. over it every time. And very soon you think, OK, get rid of yes. it, change it, tidy up. It could, so, it could even like, be, sorry. No, no. I just said it could even be it, not even just reading from start to finish. If you're kind of doing a second, if you're kind of struggling, uh, you know, a third or two thirds of the way in, just to say, well, I'm going to go back and not rewrite completely, but just kind of do an edit of the book and kind of write the chapters fresh and see if I can um, up the pace. It's all, all it's a lot of pruning of kind of just, is this sentence necessary? Can this sentence be shorter? That can often just up the pace by a very, you know, uh, yeah. mechanical pruning like that. And then if you do that, you kind of, you write the whole thing from fresh very quickly because it's mostly there. You hit that little part of the plot that you're struggling with at pace. So you're kind of writing towards it and when you get there you might have an idea to spur it on and just start yes. something. Yeah, yeah. I mean when I'm teaching I often think plot and narrative is one of the things that worries people most and I suppose yeah. it has to be said when you're writing a novel it is a difficult thing with the short story it can be much more like imagistic it can be a very sort of small contained moment it can be almost like closer to a poem it can be it can be very constrained and it's better in fact for a short story if it is that way but I can understand why people worry you know with a novel um, and we've all read novels that were great and then they sort of slumped at the end or there's a bit longer in the in the middle yeah uh, did you plan out the narrative beforehand like when you start to you know to really talk about the actual book when you started this story about uh, Abigail Lawless did you did you plot out the narrative like what's going to happen or did you sort of begin writing and just let it take its own shape as you went along it was the latter and uh, it, you're right when you are writing like that it can be worrying uh, it can be kind of seat of the pan stuff and you're you're scared it, it's a daunting task to begin a novel since it's such a long form uh, process and you're worried uh will, will i find my way towards the end sure. uh, for my first novel, The Conviction of John yes. Delahunt, was easier in that regard because it, it was a true life person and his various crimes had happened and it was just a case. Mm -hmm. So the plot there was kind of laid out for me. and the various crimes that he committed were like staging posts along the way. For mm -hmm. Abigail, um, I had come across this true life story uh, in a car an inquest report of the 1840s, which told this story of 
this young nursemaid who lived in a house uh, uh, owned by Mr. Nesham. She had concealed a pregnancy. She had murdered a newborn. And at the inquest, or the, you know, the medical examiner had carried out this hydrostatic test, which involved floating the lungs of the baby to see if they had been aerated. If they had been aerated, that meant uh, the child had taken a breath and therefore it was a case of willful murder rather than a stillbirth. And so this was a true life thing that I'd stumbled across. And I said, this, I, what if I just make that starting point for Abigail? I, I had the character in my head. I had the setting that I wanted to Dublin in 1816 in this strange year without a summer. So I just needed a kind of a way to get into the plot. And by including this kind of early strange forensic test, it kind of then automatically introduced that kind of forensic aspect of the book. Yeah. The, yeah. The and I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yes. having uh, so having her father there uh, straight off the bat as well. So I had so it was really just this uh, idea for a scene really that got me started, and then I had to just build the plot from there about you know who is the father of this child, what is the story, what what is Mr. Nesham's relationship to this shadowy brethren group, and. Um, mm. So it was finding the plot, which which can be daunting. Like right? they, they describe uh, writing a novel as driving on a windy road at night, and you can only see as far ahead as the headlights. Yes. But you just you just have to trust that the road is there, even though you can't see it. You just have to trust that it's there. It's a good yeah. I haven't heard that before. That's a very that's a very very good analogy. And um, was it there was a real Mister Needham then? Mister Nesham, yes. Oh, so, oh, sorry, Mister Nesham, Mister yeah. Nesham. Uh, how close is he, the real man, to the man in your novel? No, really there, it was just plucking the name, just because okay. um, <laughs> just because this, I, I, I liked this, true. I mean, it's a tragic story, but I liked it as, a, as a, a, a way in for the novel, and so I just plucked the name. I think uh, writers tend to be magpies, and we just pluck things here and there, either turns of phrase or mm. uh, whatever it could be. Um, the leader of the brethren, Mr. Darby, was very much based on a real man, called Mr. Darby as well. Uh, he was the leader of the, uh, what became known as the Plymouth Brethren. Uh, their first meetings in England took, oh, place, yeah. in, right. took place in Plymouth, so that's mm -hmm. where the name came. But they actually started meeting first in Fitzwilliam Square. So another story that I come across oh. through my Fitzwilliam Square research. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I plucked them from the um, 1820s, which is when they started, moved them back to 1816, just because they seemed like natural antagonists, uh, conservative, austere antagonists for our young Carol and Abigail. For, for, for her, yes. Um, which brings us to the whole question of research, which is obviously a very important thing for anybody writing uh, historical fiction. Um, you have sort of an inside track uh, I think you were fated to be a historical novelist, yeah. and what you've been telling what you've been telling us, this, uh, you know, this afternoon is sort of makes that clear. You know, the history, the chance archivist discovery, and how does all led, how does all led through, and your sort of career path or your life, your studies, your interests up until the time you were writing this book, um, prepared you very well for writing historical fiction. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about research then? Um, using stuff you already knew, um, did you need to do an awful lot more to find out about other things? Um, just on how you handled it, did you find it difficult, easy? Just research and how you used it. Yeah, as you say, I think I definitely had the head start of being immersed in archives in general and doing this uh, research for house histories and the students and so on. So I definitely had a head start there, which might be hard to replicate if you're starting from scratch. But I think for any historical novelist, research is going to be a constant element of the writing process. It, it's often just a case of this constant uh, fear of anachronisms, of getting something wrong that just plays on your mind all the time while you're writing a scene. Now, that might be a personal thing as well. Yeah, I'm sure some people are happy to write and then fact check later, which might be a better way to do it. I'm the type who, if I come across a little point in the novel, uh, uh, and I just have to check, was this uh, thing possible? Like in, I remember in Delahunt, just wrote a line, uh, 
I, I, I lit an oil lamp with a match. And already I just said, did matches exist in 1842? This is something <laughs> that I think you have to go check. And I did. I went down this research rabbit hole. And yeah, matches were uh, available in the 1840s. They were sold in bundles tied up in string. They were called lucifers. You could just strike them against any surface. And so I was very pleased with myself. I had done all this research. And when I got back to the line, I just said, I lit an oil lamp and left out mention of the match altogether. So <laughs> kind of a wasted effort. So it's, it's that kind of thing. I think I'm a bit of a procrastinator as well. So this is it's a perfect excuse to procrastinate when you're writing, just to say, oh, I better fact check, I better check that. I can't, I can't, couldn't possibly go on, so I know that. <laughs> So it's just something, so it's definitely a part of uh, the, the everyday uh, mm -hmm. writing scene, it's just to, to, to guard against anachronisms, mm -hmm. but also something like The Coroner's Daughter, where forensics is going to play a huge part in the novel. Obviously, be, to begin with, I had little knowledge of forensics anyway, definitely had little knowledge of forensics in 1816. And so there, I was very lucky that in 1816, a book was published by a surgeon called George Mayo called The Epitome of Forensics. Uh, Mayo had been uh, aghast at how uh, medical evidence was being overlooked in cases of murder in the early 19th century, simply because coroners tended to come from a legal background, and so they just didn't trust medical science. Mm -hmm. And so um, Mayo said to, to write this, Mayo said, I'm going to put together this textbook of uh, what a coroner should do when a body is discovered, what are the various signs of wounds from various weapons, what are the tests to establish poisons, very clear uh, outline of a kind of a snapshot of where forensics was in 1816, perfectly timed for me, it was just a fluke again. So that became my textbook for Abigail, and that's the kind of thing that now you can just find online because, because the libraries of the world are being digitized, and um, these uh, contents are just available through simple searches of mm. archive.org or whatever it might happen to be. And so this 1816 book was constantly mm. there on my computer screen, um, always a, a beautiful scan. So it was like looking at the real Easy thing. to read, yeah. Yeah, and so, so research in general, there, it, it's becoming easier in terms of things are much more accessible. It's not a case of having to lose yourself in it archives or even go to libraries anymore there's so much that can be found online and um, but because of that also you can get completely bogged down in the research side there's just so much to look at and then it's a case mm -hmm. of what to include and mm -hmm. what to exclude from the book itself and there so the, the danger is that a historical fiction writer wants to show off their research and um, make sure that you know all the stuff like the, the matches example but um that the test that I put there is only include any kind of little fact that you found through your research, mm -hmm. only include it if it is important to your character. Mm -hmm. uh, your, this, your character is, yeah, yeah. your character is living in this world and they're not going to notice the everyday things that, you know, mm -hmm. a person wouldn't notice mm -hmm. because they don't think they're living in the past. Yeah. You see, Andrew, this is why I think your historical fiction is very good. And it's the case, the example of the match, where somebody might have said they struck a match and let and said, wondered, I wonder had the matches in and thought, well, who knows, and gone on <laughs> and just left it in there. You didn't. You did the research. But having done all that research of them being called Lucifer's and being in bundles, lots of writers would say, right, how interesting. <laughs> I must put all that in there. And the book would have died with all this other stuff about matches and everything yeah. that you had researched. And I think you know how to really calibrate the research and what to include and what to leave out and how to sort of weave it into the texture of the story. Um, and I think you use your imagination very well. I think the way your imagination and your research and your historical knowledge and your craft of writing all sort of mesh is really interesting and I'm glad you read that bit about Fitzwilliam Square uh, in the at the very beginning of this um this talk uh because I think that's a very interesting example of it like one of the things that's amazing and beautiful is that you you describe it as if half of Fitzwilliam Square hadn't been built 
and how there's a you know it you because that is the way it was at that time and this beautiful view down to the Dublin mountains and there are other scenes like that that are fabulous like there's little um, almost like little time capsules where you have traders or there's a scene where Abigail is walking through the city with, I think it's with Clarissa and they pass the river and they see all the ships. And again, you get a real sense of that. You use smell as well, you know, the odours of things, but just in, in a small way, you don't sort of batter the reader over the head with all these images and researches. They're all very well woven into it. So that was something that impressed me very much. And I think for anybody who's watching, watching this event today and who's interested in historical fiction, um, Obviously, if you haven't read the book, go and read it immediately afterwards. But if you have read it, read it again and look at those, that, that texture um, and how those things, as I say, are all woven in together. Um, there are various set pieces, I would almost call them as well, which are very well done. I think the main one I would, I would focus on would be the party in uh, uh, Lord Charlemont's house. Um, uh, would you like to say something about that? You know, because there's so much that you've that you've included there that, and in a very sort of smooth, wonderful way. Well, thank you, and thank you for those previous comments. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, I I always had this idea of the ball at Charlotte House as being a kind of centerpiece of the book. It was kind of an opportunity for most of the characters that have been introduced to be in the same room uh, at the same time for Abigail to interact with all the players at once. It also was a chance to show that Abigail wasn't completely uh, concerned with only macabre and the fascination with forensics and so on. She was a young lady at the time and these kind of things would have been as important to her. And it's nice to show her friend Clarissa as kind of taking her under her wing. And Clarissa likes Abigail as a cool kind of interesting friend, but she also wants, wants you know, just a friend to go to the ball as well. So, this was always going to be uh, one of the set piece events. And I based it on the Netherfield ball in Pride and Prejudice. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and I was lucky in that the BBC produced a documentary about 10 years ago, well, shortly before I, I wrote the book, um, a recreation of the ball at Netherfield, where they had actors in period costume come in, recreate it from start to finish, what they wore, you know, what the order of the dances were, how they broke for mm -hmm. supper, what was served at the supper, how they continued the dances, what the final dance was. So I used that as inspiration and also, again, just kind of the, uh, the confidence to say, okay, I think I'm probably getting this right. You know, I think this is going to be authentic enough. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then it was just fun to send Abigail to this ball and have the kind of, you know, awkward social mm -hmm. interaction, mm -hmm. uh, just the, the spectacle of it all the opportunity for kind of skullduggery where she sneaks off and sees people meeting in shadowy corridors and so on. So it, it was nice from kind of the visual point of view, it was nice to advance the plot. Um, and so it was fun to write and it, it was kind of a, a centerpiece of the whole book. Yes, yeah, it, that, it sort of sits very solidly in the middle very, and very confidently and very well. And there's lots of ends. It's a very enjoyable, particularly enjoyable passage to read. Um, speaking of enjoyment, when you were writing the book, what did you enjoy most, either at the time or when you look back? Um, I think it probably was the character of Abigail. I just really liked her as a character. Like having written the first book, Convictions of John Delahunt, and being inside this amoral head for so long. Like it was fun at times, but it also went to very dark places. So it was nice just writing from the point of view of the hero and just I, I liked Abigail's character in general and um, kind of you know, being with her and, and you know sending her into danger but then uh, getting her out of it. One of the reviewers in the UK said Abigail is great company which I liked as a nice thing yes. to say. I think, yeah. I, I think I found that myself so I think that was the most enjoyable part of writing the book. Very good, very good. Uh, yeah, that's a, I get that comment, you know, um, which is a testament to her the sort of complexity and credibility of 
of the character. Um, and I'll ask you the sort of converse question. What did you find most difficult or was there anything you really didn't enjoy or really struggled with or gave you the most problems? What was the hardest part? I think there it was, as I said, I started with this idea for a scene that came out of a, a true life inquest and mm -hmm. then just let the plot develop from there. And perhaps uh, I'm, I'm writing a, a sequel at the moment and I'm, I'm going to plot it out um, much further in advance just because seeing where the plot took me uh, led down some blind alleys, those cases of this isn't working, come back and find another way forward. Mm -hmm. So I think, and as I mentioned, the Delahunt book, the plotting was pretty much done for me since um, it was based on, on true life really? crime. Mm -hmm. that I just had a staging folks. I knew, I knew the ending before I began. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suppose it was a learning curve as well, an experience of some a, a novel like this that really has to be very heavily plotted for it all to work and come together. Yes. Perhaps I should have done that more beforehand rather than finding my way through. So mm -hmm. that probably was the most difficult. It helped being in the workshop that, you know, you could get feedback on these things and uh, find to find a point in the novel where you're felt comfortable with and try and find another way through. Like there were times in the book where I wasn't even sure who the main villain was going to be and what, what, the, what the final mm -hmm. chapters, how they were going to look. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was just finding my way there. Um, and if I, if, when I write the sequel, which I'm doing now, it will be more plotted in advance. Right. It's interesting to know you're writing a sequel do you want to say anything more about that? Maybe you don't, that would be understandable. But if you do want to say anything, I'm intrigued to know that. Yeah, well, it's very much, uh, yeah, thanks to this uh, one Dublin boost. You know, the book yes. was always, it had always kind of left itself open for a sequel. Uh, so I always wanted to return to it. But this boost kind of came out of the blue, so uh, it was the perfect time to do it. Mm -hmm. I heard about the, the news, uh, I, I heard that I had been picked last summer when I was uh, in Tullinally Castle in County Westmeath on one of these archives jobs. I was surveying the archives for the Packenham family, uh, the Lords Longford, the Earls of Longford okay. uh, yeah. in Westmeath. Mm -hmm. They even gave me a flat in Tullinally Castle for the duration of the evening. It's like living in the middle of a BBC murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so and I was up in that archives room when I got the email from One Dublin. I just said confidential in capital letters in the subject heading. I said, is this a scam? What's going on here? So it was fantastic news. And then I looked out from these massive bay windows in this archives room, looking out over this estate. So that night that felt appropriate to be in this great house, mm -hmm. surrounded by archives, mm -hmm. those are the aspect of my career. Anyway, it was a completely inspiring place to be. So um, yeah. for the sequel, I'm just sending mm -hmm. Navigate off to uh, a big house in Western mm -hmm. for a big house murder mystery. Yeah. And can I just say um, what a wonderful initiative the One Dublin, One Book, uh, the whole the whole scheme is. And I think your book was a particularly great choice because it is such a very good book about Dublin. You know, the settings are there, the Rotunda, Fitzwilliam Square, uh, Rutland Street, you know, St George's Church. There's so many places that would be familiar to people and it's a blessing to base and you feel very sort of grounded in it. Um, and also then all the different topics like the brethren, the science, the forensic, the weather, um, the sort of feminist side of it, if I could put it, put it that way. It has given great scope. The fact that it's historical fiction, it has given great, great scope. But just do want to say that it's a terrific book about about Dublin. Um, and you're not from Dublin originally yourself, are you? No, uh, I'm from uh, Enniscorthy in County oh. Wexford. Yes. Enjoying all this one Dublin stuff. Uh, I, the, the one Dubliners keep saying I'm a Wexford author, but when I go home, they remind me, you're not a Wexford author, you're an Enniscorthy. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, <laughs> very particular. But well, you're in well, very good company. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really good. both my parents oh. are from Dublin. Like my dad uh, was born in Smithfield, so right in. Uh, oh yes, totally, uh, totally. My mum uh, was grew up in Drumcondra, which is where I live now, pretty much. So because of that, all my extended family are Dubliners, and so oh. we grew up in Enniscorthy. We're constantly up and down family events and so on. Yes. And then, since college, I've been living here for 25 years, so. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's 
yeah, it's kind of home now. It's, yeah, but it's sort of home now. Um, a thing I haven't mentioned, and I just want to, there's a couple more things I want to, I want to cover. If, again, because it's an important element of the craft of writing anyway, and particularly maybe with historical fiction, it's dialogue. Um, and how you make that again, the dialogue is very authentic because it doesn't feel like dialogue of today, but it doesn't have that awful sort of black adderish stilted yeah. fake thing that you sometimes get in historical fiction. And again, I really admire how you negotiated your way to do that. How did that come about? And, and again, any tips for people who might be attending the event who are interested in uh, in writing historical fiction dialogue how do you deal with that yeah i i think it's something that you might develop an ear for by uh, the research side of it and again i perhaps have been lucky to be immersed in archives more than most would be and even if you're researching for a historical novel you might not have that opportunity to work with archives quite so much but when you're dealing with uh, estate papers say and you come across a collection of letters written by somebody in the early 19th century, whatever happens to be, you're just going to naturally pick up their terms of phrase, the rhythm of what they're saying, and um, I think you develop an ear for it. But you're right in saying that you can't then, when you're writing historical fiction, you have to be careful of uh, reproducing that form of dialogue uh, directly because it might just come across as pastiche, it might just come across that you're kind of aping some kind of early 19th century style. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think readers of historical fiction do expect a certain modern style of writing, even though they realize that it's historical. Um, it's also the case that you don't particularly have to be immersed in archives. You can just read the fiction of the time, which is contemporary fiction as far as those writers were concerned. Mm -hmm. And so well, that, that's true for, say, uh, 1800 on. The further back you go, the, the more difficult these things are. So. Uh, that's, it's another aspect, like I'm, when we talk about historical fiction, I'm talking about 19th mm -hmm. century Dublin, mm -hmm. which is familiar enough, but like mm -hmm. if I was to tell the story of Citric Silkbeard in 990, <laughs> you wouldn't have time, but yeah, <laughs> Iberno Norse, I'm not even sure what language he spoke, I'm not even sure <laughs> if he could speak with, how many mm -hmm. donors that he speak with, but were they mm -hmm. intelligible, mm -hmm. so, but even then, I think historical fiction readers allow that, of course, you can't just have interpreters following your characters around. Let them just a kind of a common language. How they work, we won't worry about that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that style of language would be much more modern. You couldn't possibly know of or even reproduce the rhythms mm -hmm. of particular dialogue. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of 19th century being familiar enough, uh, it being accessible in terms of either archives mm -hmm. or novels at the time, but also just this sense that readers uh, will give you a lot of leeway in how you present dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, um, y yes, it's clearly that period that interests you very particularly. Um, the sort of 18th into 19th, what's called in academic circles, the long 18th century, which sort of goes over into the 19th, yeah. 19th century through the period you're, you are writing about. What is it about that particular period of history, rather than say high Victorianism or Middle Ages or whatever that appeals appeals to you? I, I think it just must be the, the, this Georgian house history uh, research that I've done. Just mm -hmm. has made me very familiar with it. Now you're, you're right in terms of that, that, that those Georgian houses, you could especially you know, they were being occupied through that Victorian period, for instance. But there's mm -hmm. something about just the excitement of that time when these houses were being built and just imagining Dublin being kind of created in front of you, like that passage from Fitzwilliam Square, mm -hmm. perhaps, where it was built. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a small leap of imagination to see that, but then it's quite dramatic when you kind of imagine uh, mm -hmm. being there and only two or, two, two or three of the terraces are there, one is as yet unbuilt. So I think it is just that research. And um, I mean, for Delahunt, it was the story itself was set in 1842. So there was no particular mm -hmm. way around that. And for Abigail, um, it was this year without a summer that caught my attention. Um, mm -hmm. This uh, 
eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia in 1815, which sent a dust cloud over Western Europe and North America, turned the sun mm -hmm. over head and all this kind of thing. That just struck me as this great eerie atmosphere of historical fiction. Mm -hmm. So that, that year was kind of chosen at random in the sense that I, if, if, if that explosion happened to be in 1830, I would have set it up there. So mm -hmm. it was kind of using this real life mm -hmm. event that creates mm -hmm. an atmosphere just made me choose that year but it, but it, but also I was perfectly comfortable in that era anyway because of the previous the research. research and the work the work you've done yes I think that whole you know to use the English term like the whole Regency era was a time of great energy and innovation and obviously there was extraordinary literature came out of it as well as the time of Jane Austen Keats, that, that period, like very early, early 19th century, as opposed to say the Brontes or Dickens would have come much, much later. And I think it was a very sort of lively time, if I could put it that way, because yeah. it was very dangerous and very, and very sort of rough and crazy. And there was an awful lot of money around and this sort of big building, building boom that was happening. At that stage, obviously the parliament was still in Dublin in the yeah. in the 1700s after the Act of Union. So many of the sort of upper class people connected to England, the people who were building these houses would have would have left and it enters a very different period, period of time. And then of course later on you have the in the middle of the 19th century of the famine. But I think this whole, um, um, for, for better or worse, <laughs> there was an awful lot of energy at that time, I think, sort of flying around the place. And that's one of the things, like in terms of building and money and thought and all sorts yeah. of things. And that's one of the things that make it, make it interesting. Um, Absolutely. It, there's, I think it's, it's, a, it's an easy, it's kind of an easy time to imagine in terms of the fashions and, uh, the style and like Bridgerton mm -hmm. being so it's popular. I mean, it's kind of you know fun and fluff, and you wouldn't take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, it's it's an attractive era in terms of, as you say, the energy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the characters, the scandals. Um, so mm -hmm. it it does it does definitely lend itself to to historical fiction. Yes. 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 Um, and maybe because of the fiction of that time. A lot of it being so good. So like I said it was a wonderful period for fiction or for, for literature generally. Um, and then uh, leading into the um, you know, leading into the 19th century, I think that maybe culturally as well, a lot of those books, like Jane Austen, have been used, as you said, for movies and TV adaptations. And so people nowadays are quite interested. It's been sort of gateway into that into yeah. that period um even if it's it's often predicated upon the sort of upper class people but what is nice in your book is as well you have all the people like the people who are making the dress for abigail the workmen the coachmen they're all very foregrounded and it's a much you know i really like the way you you included sort of the whole of society in it um yeah that was, you, that was something i was conscious of uh because the the stories from that period as you say they tend to come from the most privileged classes and really that's mostly because those are the stories that were written down so if you are looking for inspiration from archives and whatever mm -hmm. memoir they are going to be written by uh, privileged mm -hmm. simply because they have the education to to write them down and mm -hmm. keep or have the space and the money to store their archives and so on mm -hmm. so it's um and so it, like all, all it's not just here in Ireland, but generally uh, stories like that uh, mm -hmm. set in this period and historical fiction in general tends to tell the stories of more privileged classes. So it, it was, you know, I was conscious of trying to just, and as well, just to make the world more authentic, uh, to show a mm -hmm. uh, spectrum of what was going on in the city. And it was mm -hmm. nice, it was a nice way to show Abigail's kind of the coziness of her household and Mr. Lawless's kind of egal egalitarian streak Mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a nice familial relationship with Mrs. Perrin, the housekeeper, her son, the coachman. And so it's a kind of small, insulated world, but it's kind of a cosy uh, retreat for Abigail to escape yes. this trip. Yeah, and the more, um, the more uh, sort of modern aspects of it, the sort of scientific, secular, 
part, although it was obviously still not a very, it wasn't a secular society at that time, but the, the sort of first stirrings of that were coming through um, in, in the, so the whole scientific thing. So again, it's great that you address that to show a society that wasn't like in stasis, but that was opening up into, into what it would be later, as I said, in Victorian yeah. and then into the eventually into the 20th century up until up until today and um, could I ask you a little bit uh, about um, do you read a lot of books do you tend to read historical fiction do you read uh, you know as in books like your own that were written now about the past do you read a lot of work that was written in the past um, and uh, how does how does that sort of feed into your work yeah I think when I was younger, I tended to read more 19th century work, possibly 19th century books, possibly because uh, they were set on the college uh, curricula and so forth. And, but I, I just uh, developed a liking for them. So just from the authors that you mentioned earlier, like Austin, mm -hmm. uh, Henry James and Dostoevsky. And so I would have read quite a lot of books written in the 19th century, which perhaps I don't do anymore. I'm not sure when a point came where I said perhaps that's enough or I felt I would read enough from that period. Um, but then I still would enjoy historical fiction, but it's not, again, something that I particularly seek out. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, the popularity of historical fiction is kind of cyclical. So when Mantel's at inner heyday and getting the bookers, the whole historical fiction genre got a boost. And so I would read those books the same as, as most people were reading at the time. But it's, yes, it's just part of my reading in general. It's not something that I focus on. And reading in the ninth, reading books from the 19th century itself has perhaps something that I stopped doing, but perhaps I should go back to it. Mm. I, remember, I remember enjoying it. Yeah, but I think that's true, as you said, like Henry James, you know, you read different people at different times. And I think that's one of the great things about about reading, you know, and about having all your books, I see all your lovely books behind you. It's great to sort of look and remind you of times. And, and it is again, very good. You can go back much later and look at things again, and you're bringing a revised self to read them and books that yeah. did mean something to you at one stage, you're seeing them in a, in a different yeah. level further, further on. And possibly, yeah, books that you had meant to read at the time, but your tastes had kind of gone elsewhere to kind mm -hmm. of read those tastes yes. again. That's it. And they're always there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Andrew, I see a few questions there in the chat. I thought I wasn't able to access the chat, but I think I can. Will you have a look at them and see if there's any? Um... Yeah, there's a nice, there's a nice question from Brian. Uh... Yeah, the historical fiction courses in Dublin and the Irish Writer Centre. I think, yeah, if you just, or you're, you're, you said that you can't see anything upcoming. If there's something, would Andrew deliver a huge course? Well, <laughs> if they asked me, I certainly would. <laughs> that would be a nice, that would be that a nice, brilliant. Uh, to a be. nice circle. Yeah. <laughs> to, to be. Like me kind of, mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, me, me starting my writing career mm -hmm. in the Irish mm -hmm. Center at a historical yes. fiction workshop. If you asked to live yes. Um, I'll, are you okay, Andrew, if we'll, we'll uh, read out the other, the other, questions as well to I'll read them out if you want to answer them. Are you okay with that? Sure. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Lee has asked, as a former professional archivist with the lar large organizations you were arch archiving for, when you came to write this novel, did you have access to deeper and further records and sources than a first or second time novel writer? Uh, and then some nice things. I'm glad you're enjoying the enjoying the both the interview and the novel. So, um, did you get a sort of an inside track because you were a professional archivist? I think that I think that must be the case. I think yes, just yeah. being immersed in immersed in archives in general. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, kind of gave me a bit of an ear for the language, and also just there is a kind of a. I wouldn't say a skill set, but just you have to know where to look for certain archives. You have to mm -hmm. visit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, being able to find your way through the finding aids, especially for collections that mightn't be very well catalogued. Mm -hmm. So having that experience kind of opens that up. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's not something like there's, there's very few really uh, 
there's very few instances where I've directly taken a story or an idea from archives mm. themselves. Like plenty, plenty of, of stuff that is just made up. So mm. for someone who's wishing to write historical fiction, there is definitely no need that you have to go into an archive and find primary sources. Mm -hmm. There's plenty online, even through online newspapers. And as I say, things like archive.org, where uh, something like the epitome of forensics is just there for you. And even just kind of, you know, uh, recipe books and uh, dancing manuals and all the kind of things Et that etiquette, <laughs> yeah. etiquette books, <laughs> exactly, yeah. anything that could um, just enrich the world mm -hmm. and it kind of it all, mm -hmm. all kind of adds to world building. Mm -hmm. So if you just kind of uh, feel mm -hmm. comfortable in this world that you created and you mm -hmm. uh, hope to make it as authentic as possible, mm -hmm. it's not particularly necessary that you yes. That you like you probably, like I suppose short answer to that question, you did have access and do have access as a professional archivist to more material, but as a professional archivist, you and your uh, peers are doing a lot of work to make it available to people um, in history books and in reports and whatever. So you're doing all the work so people then can just access this stuff in libraries and Right, historical yeah. fiction. So it gives you a bit, you know, it gives you a bit of an inside track. You're saying other things, but lots of these other things are also presented further down the line yeah, by professionals, but self. So people who are writing can get at everything, you know, in a sort of roundabout, roundabout yeah. way. And the main so, thing with all, with always, with all writing, the main thing is just to sit down and do it, and you know, don't get too bogged down at research. And um, really, if you're inspired mm -hmm. by a story. Uh, you know, just the main thing is get down on paper. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, any other questions there you particularly want to answer? If you have a little run through them, Andrew, and if there's, we have time maybe for one or two more, if there's anything you want to answer. Can um, you just read, can you just the, read the question out? Yes. Yeah, so Carol asks, can you reveal some of the common mistakes beginners writers make? You'd mentioned overlong sentences. I think that is one uh aspect that uh, writers tend to overlook just the pruning of sentences and um either taking sentences out or making them shorter just as it, it, it's a very kind of mechanical way of describing it but it definitely can help there's common mistakes where uh people use the same word too often they often <laughs> use that word three or four times in a paragraph and for some reason everybody does it and they it, it, only when it's pointed out you go oh my god how did i manage that yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's these kind of very simple things that when they're pointed out to you you kind of realize it and then very quickly you can stop it happening but it, it is it's uh it, you can definitely see an improvement of your writing just by three or four small mistakes clearing them out of your writing in general will improve mm -hmm. yeah yeah there are a few there are, lots, there are lots of common mistakes one makes um i think that thing what you're saying about repeating a word that is so common I have done that I remember doing that myself embarrassingly through, with embarrassing consequences very long ago but um a way to pick up on that is by reading it aloud because when you have to say a word you let your eyes slide over it on page five or six yeah. times yeah. but when you have to say the same word aloud five times by the third time you're thinking hmm, maybe something else um yeah. uh, so I've, had to do, so I've had to do a lot of readings for these events this month there's no mm -hmm. better time to edit your book five minutes before <laughs> <laughs> the pencil comes out to say, what are they? Yeah, go, go over it in that way. Another mistake sometimes you would come across is, um, I come across this sometimes when I'm teaching, you know, people have an idea, they can see something in their head, but they haven't actually put it into the page on language like they haven't got it in yeah. there and they can sort of see it because it's in their mind so when they read something they say well it's there and then but if you say well where do you tell us that she left the building at that point they say oh i didn't did i yeah. so that's also so something mm -hmm. yeah just to take it up on that that's also something that comes from editing and rewriting Yes. You kind of write a scene once, and because you've written it a certain mm -hmm. way, you say, okay, that's what happened. And mm -hmm. then if you go back and change it a certain way, you realize mm -hmm. it's taken out by the mm -hmm. innovation. But because it was yes. there originally, you somehow feel it's still there. Uh-huh, yeah. Would you
would you be interested in teaching? Somebody was asking, you know, if you were to do a course, I'd say it'd be very good. Yeah, I think uh, I think I would. I think like I got such benefit from this workshop mm. uh, setting, and since it's so uh, submission based, whereby really like there's a moderator who leads it, mm -hmm. but we are are commenting on everybody's mm -hmm. work in progress and the mm -hmm. collegial atmosphere. So I definitely would like something like that. Yes, yeah. I mean, the, there are marvelous for everybody. Like there are marvelous courses and a wide range of courses in the Irish Writers Centre. And some of the festivals do courses and workshops over the summer as well. I think down in Bantry, and it is a good way if you're sort of thinking about it and you just want to give it a lash and see. Well, even if I don't get on with the writing, I <laughs> make some new friends. The workshops are a good way. But if yeah. you're very serious about it too, you can learn learn a huge amount we are pretty much out of time so uh i will wrap up if that's okay with you andrew okay, okay nothing yes nothing to say. um i just want to thank everybody who has attended the event today very much for coming along i want to thank uh, the long room hub arts and uh, humanities research institute for hosting this, they're looking after all the technical side for us, which I'm so glad about. Particular thanks to Christine Hamilton. Thanks to again, again, thanks very much to another Abigail, Abigail O'Bardine in the School of English, uh, who has looked after all the Eventbrite and the booking. Um, uh, and very thanks very much to Jackie Lynham, everybody in the Dublin, Dublin City Library who are organizing the One Dublin One Book. Um, this is the, the leaflet. There are still events coming up. If you go to uh, one Dublin One Book.ie, there's still, I think, a few more. There's another online event in Warsaw coming up soon, isn't there, Andrew? That's true. That's next Tuesday, I believe. There's six events next week, so there's still quite a lot of people are Great. still interested. Great. And as I say, if you have read the book, read it again. If you haven't read it, read it immediately. Have a look at the brochure. Thank you all very much indeed. Particularly, thank you, Andrew. And congratulations, Andrew. It has been fabulous going around Dublin, seeing all these beautiful banners and the, the things in the bookshop. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed all the, all the events. It's been a really terrific book for this particular um. Uh, program you know for this initiative for this initiative it was an, an excellent choice and it's been lovely for me to work to work with you so thank you very much indeed enjoy the rest of the, the month and the the events and thanks to you all thank you very much goodbye thank you.